Today, I would like to start a series of lectures under the common title Making Sense of QFT. In this first lecture, I'll give you a motivation and a plan for the entire course. At the end, we will also discuss Poincaré symmetry, which is the key for understanding relativistic physics in general and QFT in particular. Of course, QFT in my title stands for quantum field theory, which is regarded as the most comprehensive and exact description of nature to date. And this praise is fully deserved because QFT enjoys unprecedented agreement with experiment for some key quantities, such as the electron's magnetic moment. This cannot be a coincidence. So QFT definitely captures some important aspects of reality. But listen what Arthur Jaffe, one of the leading researchers in this field, wrote recently. We believe that the question, does there exist a mathematically complete nonlinear relativistic quantum field theory in Minkowski space-time, remains one of the most important unresolved questions in all of science. So, what is going on here? Why such pessimism? First, I would like to say a couple of words about the big picture and give you a plan for the entire series of lectures. My idea is to tell you about what I call the Weinberg's way of interpreting quantum field theory. The standard interpretation assumes that the primary ingredients of nature are quantum fields, and the mathematical formulation of a physical theory should start from defining field Lagrangians and field equations. Then particles arise as excitations of quantum fields whatever this means. This is the way quantum field theory is presented in most textbooks, but in my opinion, this approach has just too many logical gaps. Luckily, there is another way to look at QFT. This approach was developed by Weinberg in the middle of 1960s, and it is presented in his famous textbook. The primary ingredients of nature are particles. Quantum fields also play an important role, but their role is technical rather than fundamental. The whole approach is based on Wigner's idea of unitary representations of the Poincaré group, which we will describe, which we will discuss in the next lecture. This series of lectures is based on a three-volume book titled Elementary Particle Theory, whose main message is that QFT can be reformulated as a theory of interacting particles. Actually, my understanding of Weinberg's way is broader than the contribution made by Steven Weinberg himself. I would like to start from the works of Eugene Wigner, who demonstrated that in quantum mechanics, space-time symmetries should be implemented by unitary representations of the Poincaré group. The next step was made by Dirac, who showed how these ideas can be applied, applied to multiparticle systems and how one can define relativistic interactions between particles. Discussion of these two achievements is the main purpose of the first volume of my book. In the middle of 1960s, Weinberg used Dirac's ideas and came up with a novel way to formulate quantum field theory. This way leads to the same Feynman diagrams as in other QFT textbooks, but the logic and interpretation are completely different. In Weinberg's 
formulation QFT is not about fields, but about quantum systems with variable number of particles. Quantum fields play a role as a formal mathematical tool that is used to derive relativistically invariant interactions between particles. Both traditional and Weinberg's formulations of QFT do not make sense without renormalization. Here I mention only Feynman's name and Amit as a contributor, simply because I myself learned renormalization from Feynman's works. The Feynman-Weinberg quantum electrodynamics forms the content of the second volume of my book. Renormalized quantum electrodynamics is a hugely successful theory, but it also has a major drawback. Finite physical predictions come at the expense of having infinite counterterms in the Hamiltonian. Therefore, the time evolution of states and observables is out of reach. This problem is fixed by the dressed particle theory initiated by Greenberg and Schweber. In the third volume of my book, I apply this method in its full generality and obtain a fully consistent version of quantum electrodynamics where everything is finite and well defined. This was the rough plan of the entire series. Let me now switch to today's topic. First, I will use one slide to remind you about the postulates of quantum mechanics. And then I will explain what are the Poincare group and its Lie algebra and why everything we want to know about relativity is contained in these two mathematical structures. Sometimes you can hear that quantum field theory is very different from the traditional quantum mechanics. This is not true. QFT obeys the same postulates as the ordinary quantum mechanics. It is different only in one respect. The number of particles in QFT is not fixed. These numbers are allowed to vary. From quantum mechanics, we know that physical observables are represented by Hermitian operators in the Hilbert space. Pure states are represented by arrays of vectors. And there are well-known formulas for calculating the probabilities and expectation values of observables. Now, Turn to the second foundation of Weinberg's approach, which is the principle of relativity. It is important to note that we don't need the full special relativity. We only need its first postulates regarding the equivalence of inertial reference frames. But we would like, we would like to stress one very important consequence from this postulate the set of transformations between different inertial frames of reference forms a group and the structure of this group is well known. This is a 10-dimensional Poincaré group. The group elements depend on some continuous parameters, so the Poincaré group belongs to the category of so-called Lie groups. It has four types of transformations, space translations, rotations, boosts, and time translations. Each transformation has its own generator, and group elements can be expressed as exponential functions of the generators. Note that in, in relativistic physics, the boost parameter is not a velocity, but the so-called rapidity, which is related to velocity by inverse hyperbolic tangent. Here is a simple example 
that's supposed to illustrate the idea of generators and the exponential connection between group elements and generators. For this example, I choose uh, the simplest possible Lie group, which is the one-dimensional group of translations. For definiteness, uh, we will consider how these translations act on functions defined on the real axis x. Obviously, this, act, this action works by a shift of the function argument. By using Taylor series, the shift of the function's argument can be represented as an action of an operator on the function. The operator in big parentheses is a series in powers of the operator of differentiation. This operator can be formally represented as an exponent of the shift parameter a times the derivative d over dx. So the derivative operator is exactly ge the generator of translations that we were looking for. My example was for a one-dimensional group. The Poincaré group is 10-dimensional, so it has 10 generators which were which may not commute with each other. They constitute the so-called Lie algebra of the Poincaré group. The commutators, or as mathematicians call them, Lie brackets of the generators are shown here. Later, we'll have multiple occasions to appreciate that these are the most important equations of relativistic physics. All relativistic effects are encoded in these formulas. In the non-relativistic limit, these commutators go to Lie brackets of the non-relativistic Galileo group. To recap, today we learned that transformations between different observers form the Poincaré group. We also know that each quantum system is described in its Hilbert space. And the next step would be to find out how systems descriptions by different observers are related to each other. We will come to Wigner's idea about unitary representations of the Poincaré group. This will be the topic of my next lecture. Thank you.